Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Why don't we get started? I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. On behalf of our president and director, former Congresswoman Jane Harmon, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's session that we've entitled Women's Health, Key to Climate Adaptation Strategies. Uh, we at the Environmental Change and Security Program, along with a lot of partners here in the room, are um, really in the business of trying to facilitate a dialogue and debate on issues that don't always have a place to come together, but clearly have overlapping uh, links and overlapping possibilities in the practitioner and the policy world. Uh, we've been doing that since 1994, uh, commonly like today with the support of USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health, but really trying to provide, as the Wilson Center does on all its sessions, on a nonpartisan, non-advocacy forum, a, a, a place for different communities to come together, different communities between research and policy. It turns out Wilson was our only president to have a PhD, so Congress, when they set up this institution, saw fit to represent that legacy of both scholar and policy by bringing those two communities together under one roof with a living memorial. And then we tried to do it across topics, topics as uh, illustrated by today that include uh, health and population and development and gender, uh, with foreign policy, development policy, security policy, uh, and understand how these wider, uh, in this case, climate change, environmental issues, and women's health, and, and the role of women in development uh, are issues that uh, sometimes have um, a challenge in terms of fora for debate, fora for publications and analysis and research, and bringing those different communities together in the field. Uh, so we want to try to facilitate that discussion today, um, in, in part because these are issues now that uh, I think in many ways fortunately have uh, increased attention to them, again, within their own communities. And so part of our challenge and part of our, our work today is to understand how they, how they come together. So I'm going to very quickly introduce our guests, uh, a, a distinguished panel that I very much look forward to, to hearing from. I'm going to keep their uh, introductions very brief because I hope you picked up their lengthier bio. Um, uh, Kavita Ramdas is gonna kick us off in the order of our, uh, our speakers. She's, uh, she's now executive director of Ripples to Waves, which is a program on social entrepreneurship and development at Stanford University. Uh, you will also know that she's then president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women and really frankly, a, a, an eloquent spokesperson for how these issues come together. And so um, it's terrific that she's been able to, to join us today and, and share her insights and her experience on these issues. Uh, next, Daniel Sensel has, has been kind enough to come down from, from New York and UNFPA, where he's a, a technical specialist with the Population Development Branch. Uh, he's on point, so to speak, for climate change at UNFPA. And I know from talking with some of you here in the audience, um, <coughs> that organization, UNFPA, has been um, uh, really thinking creatively and actively engaging uh, the community in understanding how these issues are linked and then ways that uh, constructive responses uh, can be put in place. So it's terrific that Daniel has joined us. We look forward to hearing from him. And then an old friend of the program, Kathleen Mogelgaard, is going to back clean up. Um, uh, Kathleen, as I think many of you in the room know, has worked on uh, environment, natural resources, climate issues in the context of population and health uh, for many years uh, here in town at Population Action International, uh, uh, recently going farther back, Population Reference Bureau, two, two organizations so where I see folks here in the room <laughs> have been real leaders on this, and she's working now on a range of these connections, and so um, we're looking forward to her uh, sharing her work on that's been on the adaptation side as well as the mitigation side of climate change. Uh, just a, a housekeeping note, we are uh, able to, to webcast today's event. <coughs> Doesn't really mean much for those of you here in the room. For those of you watching online, you'll be able to click the PDFs of those who have PowerPoints to follow that along. Uh, but when it does come, come time for the Q&A, we ask that you wait for one of my colleagues to come to you with a microphone uh, and state your name and your question so the folks online can hear it as well. Uh, so with that, we'll turn the floor over to Kavita and look forward to the conversation. Good morning. 
And uh, good afternoon, I should say. Um, here on California time, one tends to be mourning for a lot longer <laughs> than um, here. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and um, I want to thank particularly Sandeep, who um, was so persistent in um, inviting me to come out and spend some time here. And I also want to thank uh, Georgetown, where I'm currently a visiting Waldemar Nielsen um, fellow in, uh, and practitioner in philanthropy, um, because they gave me the excuse to come out here, and I was able to accept Sandeep's invitation. Um, as um, Thank you for that kind introduction. As you very um, correctly pointed out, the perspective that I come to these issues from is much more of an um, advocate activist perspective rather than a, um, a, an advocate ad activist perspective for women's rights, um, rather than necessarily an expert either in climate change or in the environment, um, or um, indeed an expert in anything. I tend to uh, not think of myself in, in those terms. What I, what I do want to be able to share is some of the perspectives um, gathered mainly from a, a long stint um, working very closely with women's rights organizations on the ground in 170 countries where the Global Fund for Women was privileged to be able to support uh, women's organizations. I stepped down um, as CEO in 2010 and have been succeeded by someone who I think will uh, very much carry the issues that we're interested in discussing today um, further. Um, Musindi Kanyoro was the former um, director of the Packet Foundation's population program and is now the um, new president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women. She's a dear friend. She's a <coughs> wonderful colleague, and I have um, every expectation that um, the work that she will be moving forward at the Global Fund will very much build on her own experience and expertise, but also um, our experience. So that's just a little bit to say sort of the perspective from which um, I would be bringing my views on this issue. For the last year, I was also fortunate to be able to be a chair for the working group um, on uh, reproductive health and rights um, that was coming out of the Aspen Institute um, Peggy Clark heads that effort, and Mary Robinson created a sort of a group of senior global leaders who were passionate about and committed to the advancement of reproductive health and rights, feeling in some ways a sense that we had significantly lost ground from a place where there had been a really fairly unanimous global consensus um, achieved, I think, um, largely as a result of their remarkable efforts of uh, UNFPA. Um, we'll be hearing from my colleague um, shortly. But you know, the 1994 Cairo um, ICPD conference was truly a moment of breakthrough in, when in many ways, um, bringing together uh, very different constituencies, constituencies around women's rights and empowerment with constituencies around more traditional development and beginning to sort of have um, a really big aha around the question of how to think about population development and women's rights in the same breath and not to be able to um, silo those into different constituencies. And I think we had a real sense for those of us, I don't know how many people are in the room, how many people were at the Beijing Conference for Women? Can I just see a show of hands? Okay, so not that many, three of us, myself as well. Um, moving from that consensus that um, for the first time really put in very clear terms a commitment to empowering, educating, and um, giving women and girls the right to be fully equal citizens in this world at every level, um, which is what came out of the ICPD as a way to achieve our larger goals as a global community around population stability, um, sustainability, both economic and environmental development. We moved into the Beijing Conference from Women sort of bringing that global consensus, feeling as though we had a very sort of strong uh, and solid platform from which to kind of move forward. Uh, I think what has been really disturbing for many of us um, is to watch where we are in 2012 when the so-called most developed and powerful, most powerful and most influential country in the world, namely the one that we are living in and breathing in and working in today, the United States, 
is in a place where not a single person in the presidential primaries for the Republican position of president is willing to even get behind contraception, much less get behind the notion of any kind of discussion of population balance, stability, et cetera. That is truly ironic because it was the United States under various Republican presidents that actually played a significant role in moving forward an agenda around global access to contraception and to reproductive health and rights, um, even under people like um, Nixon and Reagan. So, you know, this is a really fascinating um, moment of time to sort of go from the global consensus around, um, yes, absolutely, women's empowerment, women's education, girls' access to schools, women's economic um, independence. These are all critical ways in which we get to the outcomes around women's access to reproductive health, reproductive choice, that we can't narrow down development to a set of GDP um, growth rates, that we have um, an understanding um, that it is both high levels of consumption as well as high levels of fertility that contribute to a world in which there is sort of lack of sustainable growth. To get from that sort of what I would call a global consensus to a place where one of the most influential global players is essentially, um, has essentially been for the last 20 years approximately, sort of, you know, so we have um, Clinton coming in and repealing the global gag rule, and the global gag rule, for those of you who um, remember this, is um, a requirement that USAID funding, which um, for a long time, as I said earlier, had been very instrumental in making contraception accessible and available and affordable um, uh, around the globe, now um, was going to be subject to a number of issues that really reflected American domestic politics um, and the positions around abortion in particular that were being reflected here out into the larger world of how US policy and foreign aid in particular was going to be used. So the global gag rule made it um, incumbent about uh, on any organization that accepted funding from USAID to um, not only not use that funding for abortions in, in any way, or even services that included referring people to abortions, but then also um, made it often very difficult, if not impossible, for those organizations to take the funding at all, even if they had other funding for those activities. Um, so you sort of had this, so Clinton repealed it soon after Clinton's um, um, end of his two terms, the very first act, actually, the first 24 hours, I remember distinctly where I was. A, a reporter called me. I was in the J.P. Morgan offices meeting with the new CFO, Dina Dublon, a strong um, proponent of women's rights. Um, and it happened in the, his very first 24 hours in office. Um, so this was January 2001. Uh, George W. Bush reinstated the global gag rule. Then we had eight years of that. Um, and eight years in which, according to various estimates, um, you know, you really had um, a scenario in which many, many, many millions of women actually ended up being in one way or another deprived of access. And I found myself as the head of the Global Fund for Women in a very fascinating situation where um, colleagues from USAID were calling the Global Fund, which makes small grants of between $5,000 to $20,000 a year, saying, can you please support these organizations that we can no longer fund because they are doing really wonderful work in primary health care delivery, in maternal health, in on is issues of reducing maternal mortality, infant mortality, but we can no longer fund them because part of what they do is also advise around, et cetera. So I guess for me, today's conversation around this question about what is the connection between climate change and environment and access to contraception, women's reproductive <coughs> health, women's reproductive rights, in some ways what is really fascinating is why have we gotten to a point in 2012 where we're even having to have that discussion. Because the really strange thing is that in, those in these last 20 years when this debate has been going on about sort of access to 
reproductive health and rights more broadly within the United States, which has then had these ripple effects across the globe on issues of whether women in other parts of the globe should have access to those same resources, um, defined by what I would argue is primarily a struggle around morality and an interpretation of women's role and position in the world by people here in one country. While that has been going on, we've gone through the whole, you know, Al Gore gets a prize for an inconvenient truth. We've gone through the whole, oh, well, yes, in fact, yes, there is such a thing as global warming, and this is what carbon emissions look like, and this is how it contributes to um, a situation in which we are um, increasingly at risk. We've gone through numerous studies, and I, you know, they have not just come out of UNFPA, but they've come out of many, many other places. Um, we've watched climate get to a point, we've talked about rising oceans, uh, we, you know, we've had ad nauseum set of scientific discussions. Those also are being challenged, but for, to a great extent, there's some consensus around that. So why then do we have ourselves in a position where there is essentially, I would argue, and Julia Witte, um, who is a journalist who wrote a wonderful article in uh, Mother Jones last year, um, argued very much the same thing, that this has sort of become the last taboo. You know, it, th there is now no comfortable way for people to talk about the relationships between family planning and access to voluntary family planning and access to contraception and the implications for our planet. Because if you're an environmentalist, if you bring this up, you will be quickly slammed with, and I think, you know, not completely without justification, that, oh, you know, uh, this is racist, this is about population control, this is about making um, brown women in those countries have fewer children. Um, you will, as Margaret Sanger was when she, you know, began her um, career arguing that no woman could call herself free if she could, didn't have control over when and where and how she chose to have children and become a mother, um, you will have arguments about eugenicists, being a, um, being a eugenicist. And so the, the environmental people stay far away from this as far as they can because they don't want, they already feel like they have an uphill battle and they certainly don't want to muddy the waters. One example of this, Bill McKibben, who is an extraordinary activist um, and leader, professor at Middlebury College, founder of 350.org, uh, an organization that has done immense work on climate change. Um, when I was um, interested in putting out the information that have come out from two recent studies that the Hewlett Foundation funded, um, studies that were conducted by um, uh, the Futures Group and the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis that basically came out making an argument that empowering women to time their pregnancies would reduce carbon emissions <coughs> significantly, providing 8 to 15 percent of the reductions needed to avert dangerous climate change, and that the cost of providing these needed family planning services is minimal compared with many other developments and emissions reduction strategies, about $3.7 billion a year to provide access to the roughly 215 million women, both in the developing world and interestingly in the United States, which is one of the countries, OECD countries, that has the largest number of women without access to, bless you, without access to contraception uh, which is sort of a stunning thing to realize. Um, and I wrote to Bill and I said, Bill, we should do a joint op-ed. You know, we, I, I'm, I serve on the board of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. We've been doing a lot of funding of 350. I said, it would be great to sort of put something out together that talked about this. He was so concerned that this would be misinterpreted, that, you know, environmentalists couldn't afford to ally with women's rights activists and on issues around access to contraception because it would muddy the waters and make sort of this an otherwise, you know, straightforward push for carbon emissions um, messy. Well, for those of us who work on women's health, newsflash, it's messy. Um, and at the same time, I think women's rights advocates have also been very careful and very reluctant to jump into the argument 
um, because of sort of a similar set of concerns, but also because you can't discuss, for some reason it seems, anymore, access to contraception and what's happening in our political environment in the last few um, weeks should be testimony to that without feeling that you somehow will get pulled into a di discussion, debate, argument around abortion. So we've become completely incapable of separating out a discussion around contraception and access to family planning, which actually it turns out would prevent large numbers of abortions that happen every year from a conversation about the morality of abortion, the sanctity of life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I would say that as Americans working here in the United States today, it seems profoundly important to me that the willingness to engage in this from a political will space is unbelievably important in a way that is, um, I think, far trumps almost anything else. Because for those of us who have been activists on the ground, funding wonderful women's organizations in all different parts of the world, they kind of look at this debate and they're like, how on earth are we supposed to be able to argue for these issues and these rights when the, uh, when the country that is allegedly the human rights champion in the world is busy backpedaling so hard and so fast, not only from a position of, so you know what you see, and I would argue that this is actually one of the reasons we need to be very, very cautious about what is happening and, and to really push back and to step out and to speak about it, is what you will see is that I would argue girls' education has become the new microenterprise. You know, so just in the way that microenterprise was this nice, clean, neat thing that we could do, $50, and then you could feel so much better, the woman would be out of poverty, she'd have her cow or her calf or goat, whatever, and hallelujah, it would all be much better. That was the 90s, although Dr. Yunus, who actually developed this in you know, great detail, Ila Bhatt, who developed this in India, would tell you in a heartbeat that it's not the answer. Nonetheless, that was kind of the big solution in the 90s. I feel like girls' education has become that equivalent today. We are, we are all sort of now hoping miraculously that we just get these little 12-year-old pigtail girls as in the girl effect, you know, in that cute little wonderful video. Well, there's nothing messy about a 12-year-old girl in pigtails. A sexually active 14-year-old or 16-year-old, as any of you who have teenage children can attest to, is full of her own sexuality. Knows is not just some innocent thing waiting to be raped or you know put upon, has sexual feelings, has sexual desires, is interested in sex, wants to have it, and needs to know how to have it in ways that are good for her health, for her pleasure, and, for the, and to understand that that sexuality is as true for young men of her age. This is not something we want to discuss. So sex education is also off the table. And that has become another issue in which I think we, we have all become complicit in this sort of last taboo. I'll end by saying that I think the, from the perspective of those who are actually doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, why is it so important that we be able to have this conversation here in the United States? It's important because as many small grants as the Global Fund for Women or even you know, the Ford Foundation with bigger grants or others may make on women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, as long as we are having a conversation as a country that essentially is completely squeamish about the notion that addressing questions of women's empowerment is not just about educating girls behind a desk and having libraries, and that that somehow miraculously will lead to their sexual understanding and education and you know the use of condoms and a better, Yes, educated girls and women do have better chances on all of the things that we've said, and I don't need to give you those statistics. There are plenty of them, and you know them. But it doesn't happen automatically. And it has to happen in concurrence with a thoughtful and active strategy around making contraception available to communities around the globe. If we are in a situation in the United States where the Catholic bishops and others, actually a large number of evangelicals, truly believe that somehow asking an employer to cover something 
um, to ask their insurance coverage, which just includes birth control, not forcing somebody who doesn't believe it to take birth control, but simply paying for it, is somehow a moral travesty in the kind of outrage that we have seen over the last few weeks, we are not going to be in a position to be able to make sure that that kind of provision exists internationally. Neither will we have any kind of credibility to be able to argue that in an international space. So I would end simply by saying that this connection between environment and, and population um, needs to be in a place where we can talk thoughtfully about the fact that yes, more people on this planet, we've just crossed seven billion, does actually put pressure on the planet. And no, it is not just poor black women or bl brown women or um, Chinese women who create that problem. In fact, the issues around consumption in the more developed part of the world are profoundly significant. And when you know that every American baby born consumes 40 times as much as every Indian baby born, Clearly, there is a need to be able to tie those issues together. But I think silence around this issue will continue only to leave us in a space where both the planet and her women will continue to have no voice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kavita. Daniel, we'll turn directly to you. Thank you very much. I'd like to just thank the Wilson Center for having me. <coughs> it's a really a, a privilege and an opportunity to be here to talk to you about this. And I'd also uh, like to, it's very difficult to follow you, Ms. Ramdas, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, as a UN organization, we uh, try to lead, but inevitably we are responsive to the needs of member states and also to the advocacy and the messages that are delivered by and pushed by the NGO community and activists around the world. And I, again, would like to thank you for your particular role in that and for allowing us to be in an opportunity where uh, we can, I think, hopefully contribute to this conversation. So <coughs> I think, so I'm, I, I'm happy to be here to, to talk about this issue. I, I think we very much agree from UNFPA that this is a, a, a critical and in general forgotten relationship. Uh, the links between population dynamics as a whole, reproductive health, and, and climate change. So I'm going to start a little bit with some context, and, and I'll begin with the IPCC um, and also the climate negotiations. So this is, you know, by now, um, this is from the 2007 uh, uh, AR4, uh, a conceptual model of what the relationships are between Earth systems and human systems that drive and are influenced by climate change. And if we look here, um, you know, I, th I think we can start to see how population is considered. First of all, on the emission side, uh, it's, you know, kind of an old formula, an old understanding of how population contributes through the, uh, the, um, the intersection or multiplication of population affluence and technology, which uh, allows the number of people on this earth and how they consume, how much they consume, uh, and the technologies that they use to turn energy into consumption uh, to define uh, emissions. Now, um, I think the critical aspect, and I'll get to that uh, later in my talk, is that, is that these things are intersected and should not be treated individually. Um, <clears throat> and that also population matters as, uh, because people inevitably are the ones inf impacted by climate change. That point also has been forgotten, I think, mm -hmm. over, over many, many years of, um, you know, climate work, climate science, ironically enough, given the fact that the UNFCCC emerged out of the, uh, uh, in, out of 1992 and uh, Agenda 21, which, uh, you know, real principle one is, uh, is that people matter in essence. Uh, and so something that I, I really do think we've forgotten to some extent too. So population and the climate change talks. Well, um, two years ago, I was in, uh, about a little over a year ago, I was in Cancun at the uh, at COP16, I believe it was. Um, and Michael Kutaha, the former uh, executive secretary of the UNFCCC, um, actually said in a side event on the social dimensions of climate change that, uh, to his knowledge, demographic issues had never been brought up in climate change negotiations. And I think we heard some 
of the very uh, uh, clear political reasons that that's been the case. And it, it's, it's, I think we know what the substantive issues are that, that prevent it from a political perspective, but it also cuts right down some of the key negotiating blocks uh, in terms of the G77, in terms of um, you know, OECD countries and, and how this all kind of unfolds. Um, so, you know, I think from a political and a negotiating perspective, it, it's been utterly absent. And meanwhile, outside the negotiating, no, negotiating halls, it's been brought up in all sorts of ways, heavily politicized, certainly. Um, you know, the words population control, the words over, overpopulation, all kinds of things emerge. And, and very rarely are they done in a, in a well-founded, evidence-based kind of scientific way. And in part, that's because the science is hard, and in part because that's not really the message that, that, that people are always out to, to push forward. So we've been trying, we've been, I think, very active at UNFPA for the last four years to, to work with uh, key partners, uh, whether it's uh, IASA, whether it's Population Action International. Kathleen uh, was, a, was a key partner while she was there, and others, I think, are here from uh, Roger Marcus, I think, here. Um, and the in International Institute for uh, Environment and Development to uh, really develop a strong evidence base and community eff uh, communicate it effectively about um, you know, wh how population matters, about how it's grounded in human ri rights, um, how reproductive health matters, and how we can uh, make links to programming uh, on the ground, particularly for the health, well-being, and empowerment of women and youth in a way that contributes to this uh, uh, broader, more broadly. So I'm going to talk mostly about uh, adaptation to start, but I am going to touch a bit on, on the emissions mitigation discussion because I do think it's important in the context of how we frame these issues and getting really the evidence base right uh, to, to go over that a bit. And then I'll say a little bit about uh, avenues forward, including our work. Um, okay, so let's begin with, uh, with adaptation. Um, we know that adaptation is absolutely essential. Um, climate impacts have certainly already begun. Uh, we have a roadmap that's been outlined uh, as part of the Durban platform for you know maybe yet another uh, several year process to hopefully develop a climate uh, agreement. Um, but even if emissions were to stop now, we'd have climate change. And uh, you know, slowing emissions growth is, is the first challenge, let alone actually rolling it back to, to, to below two degree levels. So we have, uh, a, I think, a, a relatively good understanding of the various dimensions of um, impacts um, from short term to long term, acute to more gradual temperature increase, sea level rise, et cetera. We have a good sense, I think, of the geographies uh, where, where these impacts will hit, particularly low elevation coastal zones, flood plains, dry lands. Um, mountain areas in terms of uh, water resources and even very local dimensions of, of particular areas of vulnerability around landslides, around uh, floods and other kinds of um, impacts. But again, I think as a result of who's been working in this area for the last 20 years, we don't have as good a sense of, of uh, what, who will be impacted rather than just where will the impacts be. Um, and in that sense, how to help people adapt and not just sort of societies as a whole or uh, how to help develop uh, adaptive infrastructure or uh, other kinds of solutions like that, but how to help people be in a uh, situation where they can um, uh, you know, I experience these massive changes that are going on around them in a way that allows them to keep their livelihoods, their rights, their well-being, their health. Um, and in that sense, as we start to explore this, we see that vulnerability is very unevenly distributed. Of course, we know that you know, having economic and other kinds of resources helped you develop solutions. Um, and not having them puts you in a, in, a, in a much more vulnerable situation. We know that gender matters very significantly. And I think you know, the uh, gender community has been making good progress in the last several years, in particular since Copenhagen, to get this point made in the, in the um, climate talks. Um, that you know, gender influences all kinds of uh, um, Social perspectives, it influences resources, it influences um, the, the way uh, people experience change in their environment and the way people are, are able to adjust to it. Um, age structure matters. Uh, the, you know, whether you're a, a, a child entering the workforce, uh, an elderly person and the support structures that entails, um, the interrelationships and social networks that that brings with us, 
with it matters for how you adapt and adjust. Um, and again, where you live, whether it's in urban or rural settings, and what that means for concentration, what that means for networks, what that means uh, for your livelihoods and economic diversity. Um, and because all of these things matter, population matters, and how population changes matters. Um, and so, but, but again, the way adap adaptation, which even itself had been late to the, to the climate approach, it was mitigation very heavily to start, but adaptation has not been considered with a, uh, a perspective that population matters. And therefore, I think, you know, it, it, it's in some degree, you know, at risk of not having the actual influence on the people that it needs to, to um, hit. So the other piece of this is that, I mean, there is no such thing as an isolated vulnerability. I mean, climate change is something that's happening in a very widespread nature. It's happening all over the world. It's happening uh, in, in many places, but particularly in places, as I'll show you, that are experiencing many other uh, risks as well. Um, and so we have to think about it holistically. We can't just isolate climate and sort of try to address uh, climate. We'll inevitably, um, I think, fail at that and also fail uh, if, if we uh, separate climate out from other development and humanitarian efforts fail at those as well. Um, and so this is, this is some of, you know, in the UN we, we use a lot of jargon, but ma and mainstreaming is one of them. I, 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 I hate to use the word, but um, the idea being that, that uh, bringing it all together um, is, 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 must be the way that we can proceed because people's lives don't work in sectors. Governments work in sectors. Often UN organizations work in sectors, but people experience their lives from morning to night um, and from week to week and year to year. And from life experience and life course and stage in life to the next. So I'm going to show you a little bit. And from here, I'm borrowing actually from work by, uh, excellent work by uh, Population Action International um, that uh, looks at the intersection of some of these risks. So let's begin here. These are countries uh, where we have a combination of high population growth rate and high projected decline in agricultural production due to climate change. Um, so you can see uh, particularly the Sahel, you can see India, you can see Mexico, you can see um, some uh, other countries just below, uh, uh, just within sub-Saharan sub Africa. Here we have um, countries that are experiencing high population growth and have a low resilience to climate change. Now this is based on the vulnerability resilience indicators model and I can uh, answer some questions about that if you'd like. But I mean, I think what jumps out immediately is with the exception of a missing data point, in, in essence, almost all of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is, is experiencing this intersection of high population growth and uh, low climate resilience. And here, countries in red are experiencing those two plus uh, expected declines in agricultural production. Um, and uh, we have uh, countries with hash marks are also, on top of that, experiencing water scarcity. And then here we have countries with a high percentage of unmet need for family planning. And you can see, I think, very, very clearly that all of these th things come cl colliding together. And I think this is the first evidentiary indication that if you, if you uh, attempt to address one without addressing the other, uh, it, it, it almost is hard for me to see how it really, uh, you know, I, I, as I put this very naively, makes sense um, to, to kind of isolate these things and, and, and to pretend that there are different problems, let alone even different dimensions of the same problem. So here we're going to zoom in a little bit and we're going to look um, uh, more closely at Ethiopia. And this, this, uh, this mapping tool, which Population Action International developed really uh, provides a good way to, to, to do this in, in a way that hasn't really been done before. Um, so this is uh, drought risk, a more geographically differentiated uh, uh, understanding of it. Uh, in Ethiopia, you can see that um, Somali here, the province in the east, is, is, uh, is among the highest. And here we see total fertility rate. And you can see it's, it's very high and particularly high in, in uh, drought risk areas. And then here we see contraceptive prevalence and, and, and also extremely low there in, in Somalia in the west, in the, uh, sorry, in the east. So now uh, let me just stress, and, and I, th I chose these three, but this is also not necessarily just about unmet need because, um, you know, uh, the, the dimensions of high fertility are not just about contraception and not just about meeting unmet need, but also 
the progress, the transition from high fertility to low fertility, cultural issues matter, uh, the people's perceptions matter. Um, but the case, whatever, irregardless, uh, we have, again, even at the very local level, an intersection of, of all of these things. So I think, why reproductive health for adaptation in that regard? Um, we know, as I said, huge changes <coughs> to life and livelihoods, co-occurrence of risks. I think that the international community has long agreed that universal access to reproductive health is uh, absolutely essential, necessary for development, uh, for individual women, for families, for communities, for countries as a whole, uh, for population dynamics as, uh, also on a broader, more macro scale. And what is climate adaptation but resilience in the face of change? Um, if we want to have a people-focused understanding of resilience, then again, to the reproductive health, women's ability to choose and uh, the, the number and spacing and occurrence of their birth is, I think, at the very center of that. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit for the moment. Let's talk about this kind of risky area of population and emissions. And I, I think, you know, we've been, it, it's been a few years now of really trying to understand how to, to address this, of trying to work with our UN partners, to trying to work with countries to understand uh, how to bring this up in the context of, as I said, a, a global negotiation that has literally never mentioned this link. Um, it's a bit hard to really think about that, you know. I mean, it, it, in, a, in a world where you know, we've had how many more, I think two more billion people since the, uh, roughly, since um, 1992, since the, the UNFC emerged, the FCC emerged. We're on COP, we're on our way to COP 18, I think. Um, you know, it, it's really quite staggering that there is no mention of population. Um, I mean, I understand we're all sympathetic, but I think we have to talk about it. We, we, there, there's no escape. Um, but we also have to talk about it in the right way, and we have to talk about it in an evidence-based way, and I think that there, uh, there's a lot of simplicity and a lot of different sides, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about this now. So this is the updated population projections to 2050. So produced by the UN Population Division. Here we have uh, high, medium, and low. Uh, sometimes you'll hear the world is gonna be at 2050, uh, by 2050 we'll be at 9.3 billion. That's a reference to the uh, medium projection, and it's also uh, a reference to a massive amount of work that needs to happen between uh, now and then to actually make that projection happen, right? Um, because what's not even on this chart is the constant uh, fertility projection, which, which shoots right up. So actually, even the high projection represents declining fertility between now and 2050. So just something to keep in mind. There's a half a fertility difference, uh, half a child difference between 10.6 and 9.3, and another half between 9.3 and 8.1. Small, small differences <laughs> now and in the years to come have big implications. So um, how do we understand the effect of this on uh, global climate change and on emissions? <laughs> um, well, it matters. Okay, so we know it matters. We have that old formula, population times affluence times uh, technology equals emissions, right? Um, that we've been moving a little bit away from that because it encourages a, an under, a, a sense that if you hold two of them constant and change population or something like that, you can have a very clear sense of what the effect that, it, uh, that, that, that has is. But it, it just doesn't work that way. And in part because the, the global climate talks and also uh, until more recently, the IPCC has treated population as a number. And the fact is people emit extremely differently. And incidentally, uh, the amount that people emit correlates uh, inversely with their fertility. Uh, to be very blunt and to be very, excuse me, uh, uh, kind of uh, sort of, to just to put the, the point uh, clearly, um, between uh, 1900 and 2000, the U.S. tripled in size and population. Um, now think about the implications of that tripling when you emit 20 tons a year. Between 1950 and, and 2000, the Democratic Republic of Congo quadrupled in population and emits basically zero. So think about the implications of that for, uh, for our, our I influence on global emissions. But, of course, it's not that simple. It's, it's not just to say 
Some people emit, some people don't emit, and you know th that's that's the end of the story. Um, you know, we want, of course, to move to emissions, uh, but uh, to 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 build people's consumption, to build their production, and inevitably to build their emissions. That's of course why technology matters. Let's look at this more broadly. Um, so I've here put three different. Uh, groups of countries, other develop, uh, least developed countries, other developing countries, and developed countries in terms of total fertility rate and per capita emissions. Um, and so I think we can see that there's a, a very wide range of uh, total fertility rate all the way on the left where the least developed countries uh, stand in terms of emissions, and that means they emit uh, at, at times near zero uh, per capita. Um, and uh, the developing countries Many of them are below uh, replacement fertility. Many of them are expected to, to, in some ways, decline, but also have much, much higher uh, emissions. And then we also can see some of the emerging economies uh, that are uh, really increasing significantly their emissions. Um, so what does this all mean? Well, population growth, uh, every region, with the exception of sub-Saharan Africa, has reached replacement fertility as a whole. So population growth at the moment and will continue primarily to occur uh, in the lowest emitting countries. However, the global development effort is about bringing those emissions up. Population matters particularly because it's a multiplier not just now but in the future. So as people consume and emit and produce more, population will be a, a, an increasing multiplier. There is yet another complexity, which is that um, the transition to a slower growth and to uh, lower emissions is a development transition. In much the same way that we, we know all the pathways that women can take control of their fertility and can change their trajectories, both personal, community, and national, um, these trajectories historically have meant moving towards higher consumption and higher emissions. It's not simply the case that fewer people consume and produce more. I think the developed countries are, are a particularly good example that slowing your population uh, rate sometimes means increasing your emissions and consumption and production. Actually, it's always, almost always. Almost like always, that, right? right. I mean, in, in history, it's almost always like that. So when you put the locus of, of solutions in the population perspective, you cannot miss that the way this is a solution is by turning the development trajectory from a high emissions one to a low emissions one, making consumption and production lower emissions. And that's the green economic transition. You cannot think about these uh, influences on emissions in, in, in isolation, is I guess what I'm saying. So, but I, I also want to make a point here that we're talking about climate change now, but I also want to talk about a little bit about sustainable development. You know, climate change is a unique problem. It doesn't matter where emissions happen. They are global. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, there, is no, there, there, there are local impacts but the contributions to climate change are global in nature. So it doesn't matter if you're here or in Malawi or in Indonesia, wherever you're uh, emitting or not emitting, it, it, it's all one big atmosphere we have here. This is not the case for local environmental degradation. This is not the case for local resources like water and land that are not portable necessarily. So when we think about uh, it's important not just to think about population and global emissions. We also need to think about population and how it intersects with uh, the resources that are local and around it. I just read, for instance, that, that Malawi is on course to completely deforest by in 10 years. And this is, uh, you know, uh, under 7% of the households have uh, access to electricity, and over 95% rely continually on firewood. Uh, or some, in some instances, charcoal uh, for energy. You know, that's a level of deforestation that will have a, a minimal to no impact on global, on the global absorption ability for, for carbon. But I can tell you it will matter for Malawi. And if Malawi is at, tw is at 40 million by 2050, like it's may project to be, it, it, it's going to be a, a significant issue. I mean, there are 12 million, uh, 12 and a half million now and on an unsustainable course. So differentiate, you know, understanding the dimensions uh, of this environmental discussion and also differentiating there, I think, matters as well. Um, so how to link reproductive health and the environment? Uh, we, are, we have agreed 
that we must achieve universal access. This is, you know, again, probably another naive statement given the last, given the funding issues, given the politics, given what's happened. You know, I, I think, you know, sometimes the story of Agenda 21 is a story of agreeing to many things and doing very few of them. Um, but I think you'll find that two years before the International Conference on Population and Development, Agenda 21 has an elaborate, elaborate, understanding of reproductive health and how it contributes to, uh, to environment. So I think, and, and the world's countries agree to us, it's up to, uh, agree to this. You know, that, that's what guides UNFPA and, the, uh, and certainly the NGO communities in, in bringing this back to the countries and saying, you agreed to this, we have to do this. Um, Rio is coming up very soon. Um, Rio's been all over the place, but increasingly it's, it's focusing in on particularly sustainable development goals. Something post-MGG, there's been a reflection and understanding that, uh, that environment was not sufficiently covered in the MDGs. MDGs post-2015 will need to be reviewed and perhaps reconstructed around a broader sense of sustainable development. Getting reproductive health there is, is critically important, I think. And something that we're pushing very hard, and I know a lot of NGO community, uh, of the NGO community is as well. It's also important to pursue the adaptation side of things. There is climate money out there. There is an, we have a clear, I think, understanding of how climate matters uh, in, in the context of reproductive health and adaptation. And, um, and, and it's an opportunity that, that, that I think we have to take advantage of, uh, but again, on, on both sides here, not just limited to one. So I'm just going to end quickly by just talking a little bit about what we're trying to do uh, at UNFPA to contribute to this. So we've had, uh, I think, a real push over the last couple of years from our state of the world population uh, to a book that we've done, Population Devel uh, Dynamics and Climate Change, uh, Resource Kit on Climate Change and uh, Gender, uh, the Supporting Global Training Efforts. I think Kathleen's going to talk a little bit more about that and some work that we've done with PAI to make that happen. Um, one of the things that we're really focused on is, is taking this work local. You know, again, whether it's sustainable development or whether it's about, um, you know, urban areas and the growth of urban areas, what's increasingly the case is that differentiation and inequality matters. R urban women in developing countries are, uh, particularly as urban populations grow, poor urban women are taking increasingly the, uh, on a profile that looks a lot like poor rural women. Lack of access, lack of resources, lack of rights, lack of stable employment, lack of tenure, right? And so what we're trying to do is, is to start to bring the data foundation for that at a much more local le level, particularly through the use of census data to understand differentiation. We've also been trying to uh, really take a lead role, at least within our mandate areas uh, in the various CLOP and climate change discussions. We have active work on the ground. I'm happy to talk more about that. And I, again, just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Kathleen? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here. I'm particularly happy to be sharing this panel with Kavita and Daniel, and I thank you very much for both of your presentations. Um, both of you are a difficult act to follow, and uh, what I'm going to try to do in my presentation is take off from this jumping point and put some ideas out there that help us think through a little bit more what some of the entry points might be. What are some of the specific entry points if we want to do a better job of integrating population dynamics and reproductive health into climate change adaptation responses? Um, and thank you very much to the Environmental Change and Security Program for hosting this discussion today. It's really, um, you know, we have been having these discussions in various circles over the last several years, and to pull this group together to have this discussion at this moment in time, I think, is a really great opportunity. So thank you uh, for putting this together. So to summarize a little bit, I think, where we are in terms of this discussion right now, based on the conversation that we've had so far, 
um, I think we can conclude that universal access to reproductive health does represent a win-win opportunity for climate change adaptation. Um, we know that these are programs that are relatively easy to implement. Reproductive health programs are relatively easy to implement. We have uh, 40 years of experience in doing it. Um, and we've learned important lessons along the way about how to deliver reproductive health and family planning services in a rights-based fashion. Um, compared to other climate change strategies, reproductive health programs are um, already in demand among the world's women. Kavita mentioned that there are 215 million women around the world who have an unmet need for family planning which means that they would like to either delay childbearing for two years or end childbearing altogether, but don't have meaningful access to the information and services to do that. Um, and we know also that reproductive health programs are relatively inexpensive. I believe Kavita also mentioned that to fully meet women's needs for family planning around the world, it would cost an additional $3.6 billion a year which when we look at some of the climate change funds and the scale of the changes and costs that we're looking at in dealing with climate change is a relatively small sum. Um, from what we have just learned from Daniel, we have seen that uh, fulfilling needs for reproductive health and family planning is likely to strengthen women's and families' resilience to the impacts of climate change. And finally, it would also have a demographic impact. And by slowing population growth, that would reduce the scale of human vulnerability to climate change impacts. And let's talk a little bit more about what that means specifically for climate change vulnerability. As Daniel has illustrated, population size, composition, and spatial distribution, these are things that are constantly changing. Uh, these changes have important implications for climate change vulnerability, that is climate change exposure, sensitivity, and the capacity that societies have to adapt to the changes in climate. And yet, what we have seen is that assessments of vulnerability rarely include a consideration of detailed population trends, and particularly when we're thinking about issues like fertility and reproductive health needs. And I would contend that opportunities exist to integrate population in a better and more thorough way into climate change responses. And that's what I would like to focus on through the remainder of this presentation. In order to do that, though, I think we need to contend with a central challenge. And that challenge is that among climate specialists, understanding of population dynamics remains limited. And when I use the term climate specialists, that's a generalized term that I'm using to, for policymakers, for program managers, for planners, anyone who is contending with thinking about how re to respond to the impacts of climate change. And based on my observations in, on working on these issues for the last several years, I would say that in general, and these are general statements, that climate specialists don't typically think about population dynamics. They're very much focused on the here and now and the challenges that we're facing in dealing with climate change in the present. Um, or perhaps they think about it sometimes, but they don't fully grasp the scale of demographic changes that are coming. And this is something that really struck me when I was working in Malawi, and I know Daniel also uh, mentioned Malawi and some of the population and climate change challenges that that country in particular is facing. Um, Currently, Malawi's population is around 14 to 15 million people. Uh, by 2050, according to the UN population projections, that population will grow to somewhere between 45 and 55 million. So that's roughly on the low end would be a tripling of population in Malawi uh, by 2050. Um, when I was in Malawi and saw that the majority of the population there is reliant on rain-fed agriculture, uh, and that they're already really struggling with some of the climate change impacts on agricultural production, and that's having effects on food security issues in the country. And just trying to think about how um, that country will deal with the kinds of future impacts of climate change with a population that may be tripling uh, is something that I think, uh, if you're looking at trying to simply adapt the agriculture sector, if you're not thinking about the scale of the demographic trends that are happening, 
uh, now and, and through the future, you're missing a big piece of the picture. Um, and I think that we see that throughout the climate change community, just not fully grasping the scale of the changes that are coming. Finally, I think a third part of this challenge is that, and this has already been alluded to, that for climate specialists who maybe do think about population and maybe do understand the scale of the changes, they assume that doing something about population requires limiting people's rights. This is a misperception that I think we've talked about pretty thoroughly already. But what all of this says to me is that there is a real need for awareness raising on population dynamics, an, a raising of literacy on population issues within climate change circles in order for there to be better integration of population, reproductive health, and climate change responses. I would like to propose that there are at least four areas in which we could, we, that we could view as targets for this awareness raising and integration. And I'd like to go over those very briefly, and then I'm really eager to turn this over for a discussion with this group because I'd be interested in people's thoughts on these areas. Uh, the first is adaptation planning frameworks. The second is tools and training. A third area is program design. And then a final area that I'd like to talk about is uh, strengthening the evidence base. So starting with adaptation planning frameworks. I think many of you are probably familiar with some really helpful analysis that was done by Population Action International in 2009 that looked at national adaptation programs of action. And for those of you who are not familiar with the NAPAs, these were assessments that were done at the country level for least developed countries to assess their most immediate and urgent adaptation needs. Um, about 47 NAPAs have been completed at this point. At the time the analysis was done, uh, 41 NAPAs had been completed and 41 NAPAs were analyzed. Um, and it was found that in 37 of the NAPAs, least developed countries had identified rapid population growth as something that was exacerbating vulnerability in their countries. Uh, what we found though is also in those NAPAs, only six of them explicitly state that slowing population growth or meeting an unmet need for family planning should be a key priority for their adaptation strategy. Only two of the NAPAs proposed projects that included reproductive health or family planning, and neither one of those two projects has been funded. So as I said, the, the NAPA phase is mostly complete at this point. Um, and we did that kind of after the fact analysis to note that while population growth was seen as a challenge for adaptation, um, there was not also an opportunity recognized within that to meet women's needs for reproductive health and family planning as a way to ameliorate some of that challenge. What is following the NAPAs are NAPs, National Adaptation Plans. Um, under the 2010 Cancun Adaptation Framework, a process was set in motion for the development of NAPs. And while NAPAs identified the urgent and immediate adaptation needs, oh, sorry, uh, NAPs will assess medium and long-term adaptation needs. Uh, technical guidelines will be elaborated by the least developed country expert group by the end of this year. Uh, this was decided at the Durban climate change negotiations in December. Um, and modalities for NAP preparation include things like workshops, trainings, technical papers, regional exchanges, et cetera. Particularly since NAPs are looking at medium and long-term adaptation challenges, it seems to me that issues of population dynamics and the implications of meeting needs for reproductive health and family planning would be an excellent way to integrate these considerations into these adaptation plans. And speaking of tools and training that could fit into the NAP process and other, other adaptation planning frameworks. Um, Daniel mentioned already that uh, United Nations Population Fund and Population Action International have worked together on a set of training modules linking population dynamics and climate change. Um, these modules were prepared for 
the UN Climate Change Learn training platform, which is a UN system-wide training platform for climate change. I think it's very exciting and encouraging that the UN is interested in looking at the ways in which population dynamics play an important role in climate change. Um, and so having now developed two detailed training modules on population and, and climate change, I think, is, is a very encouraging thing. And I'm hopeful that those training materials will um, get a lot of play out there. Um, there's also a need, though, to develop additional tools, particularly as it relates to vulnerability assessment. Um, and furthermore, we need better mainstreaming, and I'm sorry to use that term, mainstreaming, not so that we just have a training module that's about population dynamics and climate change vulnerability, but that when anyone is learning about vulnerability or how to conduct a vulnerability assessment, that population trends, that fertility and reproductive health needs are part of that, not that it continues to be something that's outside a general assessment of vulnerability. And I think we have missed some opportunities. Uh, these are just two samples of uh, publications that are in pretty heavy use within the climate change community. The one on the left is a UNDP handbook on integrating gender into community-based adaptation programs. The one on the right is a handbook that was developed by CARE um, about assessing uh, climate change vulnerability and capacity. Uh, unfortunately, neither of these documents has any mention of population trends, fertility, or reproductive health needs. And really, I think what we need to be seeing is an integration or a mainstreaming of these considerations into these more, uh, into, into tools that are in wide use within the community. Uh, we are beginning to see a little bit of it, and this is an example here of some training materials developed by WWF that they're using within WWF adaptation training that happens across the organization. Um, we're hoping to see more of this. It's thoughts on how to better assess population trends and how that relates to vulnerability. And then once that assessment is done, it provides some guidance on how to address population-related vulnerabilities within adaptation projects. Moving on quickly to program design. I know many of you are familiar with population health and environment approaches. These are integrated community-based projects that have been supported by USAID and others over the past decade. Uh, they aim to meet the health and development needs of remote, underserved communities while sustaining natural resources. And a key component of these projects is, is an explicit focus on addressing unmet need for family planning. PHE programs to date have not been designed specifically to address climate change threats or to respond to climate change impacts, but there's been a lot of discussion about how this is a model that could be used effectively to do that. Um, and what we have seen in analyzing PHE projects is that there are a lot of common elements between PHE projects and community-based adaptation projects. For those of you who are working in the climate community, you know that CBA is something that's quite fashionable within the climate change community, but it's also a really important um, modality of working on climate change at the community level that is beginning to attract more and more funding. Um, some of the common elements between PHE approaches and CEA approaches include a priority on community engagement and participatory processes to identify needs and implement appropriate interventions. Um, there's a prioritization of underserved communities that are highly dependent on natural resources and support for community stewardship and sustainable use of natural resources within the project. And the projects are grounded in multi-sectoral assessment, planning, and implementation. I think there's a real opportunity for thinking about how to layer in reproductive health and rights as a dimension of community-based adaptation programs, building on the experiences of successful PHE programs. And finally, I want to say a few words about strengthening the evidence base. Um, as we've talked about already today, the evidence about the linkages between population dynamics, 
fertility and reproductive health needs and how those things connect to climate change vulnerability, this evidence base is growing. And a lot of the mapping work that has been done by PAI um, has led the way in showing <coughs> from an evidence-based perspective what those relationships are. Um, but I would argue that more is needed to more fully legitimize these linkages within the eyes of those who are working on climate change responses. In particular, I think there is a need to better elucidate exactly how reproductive health contributes directly to adaptive capacity. Um, to my knowledge right now, there's only one study that looks directly at this question. Um, some may feel that we don't need to examine it further because we have such a good understanding of how meeting women's needs for reproductive health contributes to development outcomes that are important building blocks for resilience and adaptive capacity. For example, we know that meeting women's needs for re reproductive health leads to healthier women and healthier children. We know that meeting needs for reproductive health and family planning creates greater opportunities for educational outcomes and for employment outcomes. And all of these things are really important elements of adaptive capacity. But there hasn't been enough work that directly shows us how when a woman's needs for reproductive health and family planning is met, how does that really make her better able to cope with the impacts of climate change? Um, there's been one really great study also done by Population Action International that was a qualitative study, a case study of Ethiopia that did had focus gr group discussions with women and men in urban settings, in rural settings, and included questions directly around family size and what that meant for their ability to cope with climate change impacts, uh, included questions around um, their access to reproductive health and family planning services. So we have some really great information there about women and men and policymakers all talking very specifically about what this connection is and saying that, yes, when we have access to reproductive health and family planning, I'm in a better position to cope with the impacts of climate change. Um, but right now, that's the only study that I am aware of. And unfortunately, we're not seeing a lot of the evidence that does exist appear in peer-reviewed literature yet. Um, and because it's not in peer-reviewed literature, we've not seen much of it appear in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment reports. And I do think that this is an important piece in terms of garnering greater legitimacy about these linkages in the eyes of those who are working in the climate change community. Additionally, in terms of strengthening, strengthening the evidence base, I believe there's additional work that's needed in the applied sense. Um, there's a need to develop and test tools to integrate population dynamics into vulnerability assessment and adaptation planning. I mentioned earlier that WWF has de developed a great training tool. Uh, we haven't yet had much of a, a chance to test and refine that tool, um, and I think that would be helpful in thinking about how we could disseminate it more broadly. <laughs> in addition, on the programmatic front, um, we need to design, implement, and document adaptation programs that have a reproductive health component. I mentioned earlier that PHE projects right now have d haven't had a specific climate change focus, and CBA projects as of now have not incorporated reproductive health components. Um, it would be great to see some of these actually play out so that they could be monitored and evaluated and documented for the effects that they have and how effective they can be in doing that kind of integration in achieving better outcomes uh, for adapt adaptive capacity. And before I close, I, I didn't think that this would be complete if we didn't talk a little bit about climate change finance and the opportunities and challenges that exist within the financial architecture for climate change. First of all, one of the big opportunities here is that there is a proliferation of funds for climate change adaptation. Uh, the Fast Start financing, which I know many of you are familiar with, uh, the developed countries have committed to providing $30 billion for climate change, international climate change finance to support climate activities in the developing world in the period of 2010 to 2012. Um, that's for all sorts of climate change activities, but um, a big chunk of it should be going toward adaptation. Um, and then that is supposed to ramp up to the neighborhood of 100 billion uh, by the year 2020. 
so there is a proliferation of funds for climate change activities, including climate change adaptation. Of course, one of the big challenges is that funding is frequently targeted towards specific sectors and targeted to respond to specific climate change threats. I think this is one of the big challenges that we see in thinking about reproductive health as an adaptation strategy because what the evidence shows us is that meeting women's needs for reproductive health contributes to more resilient societies. It doesn't necessarily respond to a specific climate change threat. Um, and I think we probably have things that we could learn from other sectors like the education sector or um, the poverty alleviation sector that are also these are areas where interventions can contribute greatly to climate change resilience and adaptive capacity, and yet they're not responding to a specific climate change threat. Um, so I think th that we need to have further discussion about how can we better frame these activities so that they match with the requirements of climate change funding. And finally, I wanted to point out that one of the very positive things about both the, the adaptation planning frameworks that are being developed and the, the funding priorities that will go along with that is that these are very much guided by country-driven priorities and are supposed to be country-owned. Um, and for that reason, that places a premium on partnerships, training, and technical assistance that we can engage in with our partners around the world in some of the least developed countries that are suffering uh, the, gr the most from climate change impacts. And with that, I, I will close. Thank you for uh, your attention, and I look forward to a good discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Kathleen, and thank all three of the speakers. I think we saw that uh, while focused on the same topic came from very different perspectives uh, in term that fit well together and very complementary. Uh, so why don't we now um, uh, throw the floor open and have that Q&A session that was promised up front. Uh, I have colleagues with microphones that will um, bring them to you. As I mentioned, we want to be sure to capture your uh, questions online. Okay, so we have uh, some in the back and some down front both. So Katie, let me go there and then in the back. Hi, um, Penny Starr with CNS News. I just wanted you to comment on the article that you passed out uh, that you did on um, this topic, and you mentioned in there, you cited statistics of 42 million abortions a year. Can you tell me where you got that information, please? The, um, what's the article that was talked okay, about? Okay, well, uh, Kavita may not have been the one that put it out. Why don't we hand that to her, take a couple other questions, and give her a chance to take a look at it. Uh, Ed, um, you have one, too. Why don't we collect a few and give you a chance to look at that, Kavita? Oh, this is the, this is the, um, it's the study, not an article. That's what I was just want. The okay, great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Ed, why don't we get you? Yeah, I'm Ed Barry with the Sustainable World Initiative at the Population Institute. Uh, we're very much in favor of reproductive health and greater investments in reproductive health and empowerment of women through education. But it strikes us that in order to connect these issues with climate change, we really have to talk about something that you all three don't seem to be really talking about. And that is a fundamental issue that's going on in the world. And that is all human development and well-being requires natural resources. And we're already overusing the planet's natural resources. So the question is kind of how to deal with that. And I would suggest that it's not just in a climate change framework that we have to deal with it, but we have to deal with it in a total environmental framework. Uh, and therefore, what we're trying to really suggest for the Rio process is that what has to come out of Rio is a agreement by nations to start doing what we call resource sufficiency evaluation for their populations to really uncover and highlight to the world the situation that we've got and that is that we are kind of big compared to the resource base of the, of the earth. So I'm wondering if you would comment on that and whether or not that would fit in with maybe the national adaptation plan, but that we ought to frame it more broadly. So if I, okay. if I could respond, um, first the, the statistics about um, both family planning and abortion come from the Guttmacher um, uh, 
come from the Guttmacher Institute. This was a study that was done by S. Singh. It's called Adding It Up, The Costs and Benefits of Investing in Family Planning and Maternal and Newborn Health. Um, it was released in 2009. Um, I actually think your point about natural resources is really important. And one of the things I was sort of scribbling uh, as both my colleagues um, presented that I think hasn't been on the table and clearly all of us um, actually have to put it very squarely on the table is that there are profound reasons for us to stop and examine the dominant development framework that we currently have. Because so far development has been drawn like a straight line. You know, this is your starting point, whether it's Burkina Faso or Malawi or whatever, pick whatever, you know, Nepal, Bhutan. And then it's as though it's a trajectory to arrive at the United States over here. And that is, that is the defined development model. You too can be like us. That's what we were told as newly emerging, you know, post-colonial states. You too can be like us. You can live like us. You can consume like us. You can eat like us. You can drive our cars, right? So I think without interrogating that model of development, without actually saying to ourselves, does it make sense in India? I mean, there have been so many times when I've gone into Bangalore and, or, or Bombay or any of the cities, uh, these mega cities that we have now in India, and said, you know, here we are with these wonderful traditional clothes that are perfectly suited to our climate. But you build buildings that replicate these buildings that have to be air conditioned, that then require a consumption of electricity that we just simply don't even produce in India. You don't have that electricity, so for you know, four out of the eight hours that you're in your office, you have no electricity, you're dying, but you're all wearing suits and ties because that's what development means. You have to look just like all of you because you can live inside an air-conditioned office that allows you to dress like this. And that's a very small example, but I think your point about natural resource consumption and the way in which that natural resource consumption derives from what we assume. So when Thomas Friedman says that there are millions of Americas inside Brazil, inside the United, inside India, inside, inside China, it means that this so-called global middle class that has developed, has developed with the appetite and the desires and the expectation that it should consume the way all of you do, all of us do, here in the United States. And that, I think, drives this whole natural resource consumption model also in a very profound way. And I would say, as my colleague was talking about the politics of what happens at the international level, it also drives this sort of standoff in the politics. Because what happens is, you know, the response is, hey, you guys made the mess. We were your colonial, you know, slaves at the time. We didn't have any say so. You took all the natural resources out of us. You fueled your industrial revolution and you grew, and you consumed, and you decreased your population. Now, that's the development model you've shown us. This is how you get to this level of quote unquote development. So I think it's profoundly important, and I actually think women have something to contribute over here, which is to really interrogate and question whether in fact, whether it's for Malawi, or whether it's for India, or whether it's for China, that there is this only one model of development. And in fact, that questioning should also have some, there should be some echoes and resonance inside the West. That is, the West has to be willing to say, you know, where we've arrived is not a sustainable way for us to live. And we are going to, and so this is the politics, right? The third world is saying, quote unquote, third world is saying, you know, you guys get your act together, it's not our fault we're in this mess. The West is saying, you know, yeah, but you guys have so much more population, and now look, India and China, your sort of your carbon emissions are going. So I would, I would just say that I think you, you, you touch on something so important, and I do think grassroots organizations and community-based um, social movements are trying to raise those questions. I don't know if any of my yeah. colleagues would like to ask. I mean, maybe no, we'll one, get but some more, but go ahead. <coughs> just two pieces. So I, I completely agree that it, it's essential to change the model of development. Um, the other piece is it's important to change the distribution. Um, I mean, it's, it, that, that when we talk about resources, that there, there are many ways to view. Some are, some are limited, some are capped, some are, are what they are, and others are not. Um, but the, the way uh, we, we live in an increasingly global world, some resources are globally distributed, some resources, resources are locally. I'm, I, I think the, the focus on national boundaries 
is not necessarily the right focus. You know, if we think about the top, you know, other, many people have put this forward, the top billion consumers. If we think about um, inequality within cities, if we think about cities that exist more within regional and global environments than they do within their own national boundaries, and even within cities, as I was uh, discussing a bit earlier, that, that the, the growing inequality uh, issue means that there are people who are high consumers who incidentally may also have low fertility and uh, may be in small households who are contributing in different ways. Than but who live in, in a 5,000 square foot house. <laughs> right. <laughs> or, a, you know, 25,000 square foot house. I mean, there may be only two people or three people right. living or in that house. And, and for that matter, to think about, let's think about, I, I just came from New York. I live in an apartment. I take the subway every day. That makes me a better global yeah. citizen yeah. than someone else. And simply by nature of the fact of where I live, not by a particular virtue or a particular... Uh, some, something that I've necessarily made a choice in terms of consuming less. So I just, uh, you know, it, it's, it's about technology, unquestionably. It's about changing the trajectory of resource use, and it's also about recognizing that, that, that there are a group of people in the world, I think, that, that are contributing in different ways. That's all. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Okay, we have two, two questions. Why don't we get both of those, Sandeep? I'm Stephanie Kenny, and I teach a course on sustainability and public policy at the Maxwell School, but I was also one of the three original negotiators of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and I'm here today in part because I was intrigued. And following up on the last two comments, I was a little uh, hesitant to, to raise this because I think it's extremely important to be positive with youth. But my, my, my question proceeds from a deep skepticism about your proposition. So let me just about ask the proposition. about the proposition of linking uh, reproductive uh -huh. health and population, population. To, mm -hmm. to climate change. Mm -hmm. It's a deeply flawed, unsuccessful, and failed process. Mm -hmm. uh, you have no idea, uh, looking just at the faces in this room, what enabled the negotiation of the FCCC because it was in a different era when you all were children. And that's one of the many, many, many reasons that we climate experts don't take population into account. Um, that's not what's at play at that table. Um, but I guess my question is why would you want to tie these very important issues that have substance and weight on their own to a failed 20th century vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> where the failed 20th century vehicle <coughs> is connecting population growth to the climate, climate change. process okay. to climate change. Okay. I'm just clarifying um, yeah. that question. And, and your comment about the, the, the big question, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's connected to how do you begin to bite at that big question if you're coming at it from population or if you're coming at mm -hmm. it from women's health. Um, I think are very important ones and, and I thank you because it's given me the question to be the skunk at the party and I apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> but I think, I think I'm raising both a very interesting um, and a very important question mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. and I would simply note that one of the reasons for the failure has been the glomming on of everything from indigenous rights to prevention of hangnails to the climate change process. And that is part of what has delegitimized it, what has disabled it, um, and what has taken it to the unfortunate um, state that, that it, it, it is now in. So you've got very important integrity and weighty issues on your own, why do you want mm -hmm. to connect them? Okay. Yes. <coughs> Hi, I'm Adrian Allison. Um, I'm with World Vision, and I have um, two things to say. The first is to Daniel, um, because I think, is it right, when I looked at USAID's Feed the Future, 
I did not see anything in there about increasing demand for food and response by slowing population. I, mm. I think I'm right, but I hope not. And then the other one is for Kavita, um, and for all of us, actually, because um, World Vision, as you probably know, is the world's largest humanitarian organization, 44,000 staff working in 100 countries. In this country, it's largely funded by evangelicals. My job was to introduce family planning. So, <laughs> well, we found a whole new vocabulary um, for which I want to thank AID and DHS. Um, all the data on spacing, mm -hmm. healthy timing mm -hmm. and spacing, mm -hmm. has helped us totally overcome every resistance that there has been raised except abortion. We do not, you know, we do not uh, agree with abortion. But then, of course, you have to have more family planning if you don't agree with abortion. Exactly. Yes. But the healthy timing and spacing argument, and we only looked at death, no more no morbidity, because that's not very clear. We see your, your, um, a mother's mm -hmm. dead or alive, mm -hmm. an infant's mm -hmm. dead or alive, and the data are very compelling. Mm -hmm. So the whole organization is now proud that we're saving lives mm -hmm. by saving babies. Mm -hmm. Why don't we, um, Kathleen, would you like to start us on on the the, multi, the challenged already multilateral institution of climate change and UNFCCC and why uh, with I such important weighty issues would you want to hitch your wagon to this wagon. broken bus? You know? Hitch your wagon to a sinking ship. Um, it's, it's a really interesting point and I, while I was working at Population Action International, we were starting to think about how we would engage on climate change issues, how we would help to raise the profile of the ways in which population and reproductive health connect to climate change. Um, we decided that we needed to learn a lot about the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and that, that process, and uh, we participated in a number of the preparatory meetings and went to COP15, COP16, COP17, and I think that um, there continues to be we, we've had lots of discussions in, in looking at the way things happen within the international negotiations on climate change, at least the, the framework of the UN the Framework Convention on Climate Change. What are the outcomes of that? What are the real prospects for meaningful progress on climate change, let alone trying to bring in this issue that no one there wants to talk about? Um, so I, I think it's a really legitimate question, and I don't think any of us feel that linking to the UN FCCC is the solution to be doing a good job of integrating these things. I do think that it's critical to integrate them. I don't think that we can have effective responses to climate change, whether that be community responses or national responses or international responses, if there's no, if there's no consideration of population dynamics and if there's no consideration of trends in fertility and reproductive health. Whether the UN FCCC is the right vehicle for doing that, I think is still very much an open question. But the thing that um, I can Included after participating in UNFCCC dialogues is that if we're not there trying to talk about these relationships in a way that is evidence-based and responsible, we cede that space to others who will do it in a way that sometimes is not evidence-based and that is irresponsible and that may contribute to a trampling of rights. I think that's the biggest reason for us to continue to participate in things like the UNFCCC discussions, even if it is a broken vehicle, because we don't, I, I mean, this, this, is a, this is a very messy intersection to be working at, and um, if we leave it to others, I, I fear what could happen in terms of um, denying rights to people. But some of the other, um, vehicles that we've talked about in terms of entry points, doing training, doing working with uh, national decision makers who are responding to climate change. I think all of those things are happening, whether it's part of the UNFCCC process or not. Communities and nations will are responding to climate change, so I think there are ways that we need to continue to make these linkages in terms of, uh, we need to take advantage of those entry points that, that we have available to us. <laughs> okay, so I mean, I <clears throat> I appreciate the question, and and I particularly appreciate the opportunity to talk to one of the 
founders and parents of this whole universe in which we operate. Um, but I respectfully, I think, have to disagree. Um, not with your basic premise, but with, first of all, what you see as the failure. And I, I really don't see the failure of the climate talks as something, as, as, as you say, a glomming on of many other agendas. Um, I, I think there's a fundamental problem of changing the development trajectory in this world. And, and that problem, you know, you, you can have many, many, many paragraphs, but if the thesis statement is not agreed to, you will have agreement on many other things. For instance, there are 27, I believe, mentions of gender and the importance of, of uh, gender-based budgeting, gender involvement, gender uh, participation, and uh, differential vulnerability within the Durban platform, and that doesn't mean we have a global agreement, nor does it mean that that's why we don't have a global agreement. We don't have a global agreement because finding a way to decrease, to slow the growth of our emissions is is has been insurmountable, let alone going back to, to 1990. Um, and I want to say that, that at, I, you know, I've now been to three COPs. I've been to Copenhagen, which, you know, well, we all know the story, and I've been to the wonderful and limited outcome that was Cancun, and now the wonderful and limited outcome that was Durban. And I have to say that, that this conference, this past one in particular, there's this feel that the emphasis of the conference had moved outside the negotiating room. That the answers to the globe, to the world's climate problem is not to be found in agreements that necessarily will come uh, from uh, you know, country-empowered negotiators, but those that will come from people on the margins who used to be, incidentally, used to be a sideshow outside the negotiating rooms. And now it's where the serious work, I think, is happening. It's where people are developing very concrete solutions that work on the ground for understanding differential vulnerability and for addressing it. Um, I think adaptation, you know, depressingly, is increasingly the way that we have to move because we're clearly failing to get uh, an emissions agreement and to, to change that trajectory. And I can, I, I say even in three years, and that is a limited time in this world, that, that to see how we've moved from concepts to practice and to see um, how we all are growing to know each other much better and to work together to create real solutions that I think help people, uh, you know, adapt just as the solutions that, to help them mitigate are not being proffered in the negotiating room is really what the UNFCCC process has become increasingly about. And I hope it continues, actually. Um, and 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 I will. I agree with you about funding. It may never necessarily arrive. It, some of it has, though. Certainly, the fast track. But I, I just think that um, what we're proposing here is very practical, and it can really address an aspect of the problem. Um, so I'm just going to briefly speak to the other comment around World Vision, and I thank you for it. And actually, I just came back from spending some time um, last year, uh, almost a month, in Pakistan meeting and speaking with a number of um, Global Fund for Women grantees. Um, it was a uh, actually an effort to check in after the floods to see what had happened with regard to rehabilitation. But what was really fascinating was your point about how World Vision has changed the conversation with regard to um, access to family planning amongst evangelicals very much resonated with something I heard a lot from Pakistani women's organizations that have been very successful in the same way um, uh, within the context of Islam, of talking about spacing, talking about the health of the mother, talking about uh, the well-being of children, um, addressing questions of uh, mortality. So I think this is... Uh, I have a great deal of respect for the fact that I think there are, and we actually can point to numerous impressive, um, culturally sensitive and culturally appropriate um, ways in which to raise this conversation around access to contraception in a way that does not require us to be anti-faith, that does not require us to be um, uh, you know, in a place where we feel like, you know, well, you can either have women's rights or you can have um, commitment to your religious beliefs or faith. So I think absolutely, and, and, I, and I know about World Vision's work, and I think that that's important. That said, I think it is profoundly important for us not to be stuck in a space where the only way we can make, uh, you know, uh, I was going to give one more example, Iran. 
Iran has had one of the world's most successful, I mean, again, we only hear about Iran because we're about to go to war with it, but, um, or thankfully, nice news yesterday, the wonderful director who won an award at the Oscars. Um, but I think Iran had one of the world's most successful family planning programs ever, 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 and it happened after the Ayatollah revolution in, you know, 1979. So this is very important for us to keep in mind. But it is also important for us not to lose ground for secular space in which to, ex in which to have a conversation that doesn't always have to be referred back to a faith tradition. Why is that important? That is important because the space within which you can have conversations about women's rights not laid down by God or whoever else in a set of um, in a set of doctrines that have been passed through and that have to then be interpreted one way or another and quite honestly can be interpreted in numerous ways. But as you know, and Dr. Shireen Ibadi is a wonderful advocate for this, the importance of separation of church and state in the developing world, so going back to this trajectory of development, what took Europe about 500 years before you could actually have a space for articulation of women's rights is something that is in process right now in much of the developing world. So you cannot, however successful our strategies are alluding to and appealing to faith-based traditions, it is also really important to maintain and preserve a space within which women are simply recognized as equal under a civil structure of citizenship and in which certain rights are accorded to them simply by virtue of their citizenship, regardless of what they are protected by or whatever their faiths say. And I think that would be the only addition I would I would give to you know your comments. If you could wait for the microphone, thanks. Uh, a program in, in Senegal in an Islamic community. Can you imagine where our religious support came from? The imams, because yeah, we exactly. were making their communities healthy. Where did the opposition come from? The Roman Catholic Church. The who? <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed your, where did the opposition the come line. from? Catholic Church. Uh, just a very short point about the food question. Uh, the FAO yeah, yeah. does project uh, that there's a 70% increase in, in uh, demand for food by 2050. Uh, and incidentally, that significantly outpaces the rate of population growth. Um, and so that's an indication of what uh, we look for in terms of increased consumption. Kaylee, we have a, a final question down here in the front, and we'll have to wrap it up. I just, I mean, uh, the political side of things, that, that especially Kavita mentioned it before, this kind of, okay, you're asking us to reduce our fertility, but you guys aren't reducing your emissions, you're not reducing your consumption. Um, is this... Is there going to be a balancing of this kind of um, these perspectives if you try to push this agenda further? Um, uh, how are you going to address the, the political side of this question? Because I, I can't imagine that it's going to be avoidable. Um, is there going to be some kind of agreement or some kind of push for, okay, well, if we're going to take this perspective on asking people to reduce their fertility or helping people to reduce their fertility, can we also help other people to also reduce their emissions and consumption? How are you going to deal with that kind of political conundrum? Um, I'll take a shot at my thoughts on that, but I think actually um, you alluded to it a little bit in terms of talking about where the real movement and pressure and changes were happening, sort of not inside necessarily the halls of government, but I mean, I think the role of social movements, um, grassroots organizations, you know, external forces that are sort of increasingly more democratized um, and um, and increasingly more significant players in this um, are, I think, playing more of a role in which both um, countries in the South are having to pay attention, so governments in those uh, in those developing countries are having to pay attention to and listen to the forces from their own constituencies inside. So I think um, that's something that is important to, you know, very important for us to see. I mean, Bangladesh is a very good example of a country that has um, um, squarely looked at the issues of climate change and is doing that in a way that um, 
includes a commitment to reproductive health and rights and family planning is also doing that in a way that is very cognizant of and and responsive to the pressures from their own uh, very well organized ngo sector so i would say that that's that that's one way in which i'm hopeful that the the politics of this will begin to shift in ways that can be um more positive than sort of being stuck in this sort of narrow north south debate the one other thing i would say is that the one thing we didn't talk about a lot um with regard to population dynamics is migration mm -hmm. and i think one of the very important and interesting conversations that i think we will be forced as a global community to have although we have maybe it's even more of a taboo <laughs> than what the others that we were talking about is the whole question of as we are busy promoting free markets and capital and busy saying that you know free market capitalism is the answer to all the world's problems we are abundantly resistant to the idea of free markets and labor and in fact if what we actually ended up and you alluded to this a little bit saying that you know uh, country borders are somewhat becoming irrelevant but not just because well the I'm in the problem of the UN now. well no sorry <laughs> you never said that you never said that i said it um i i think it's going to be an interesting conversation i was just talking with uh, i was at the world economic forum meetings in in uh, abu dhabi with the global agenda councils and talking to japanese um professors who are talking about you know the the other dynamic which is aging populations and not enough young people right and saying well you know what we really need is an infusion of young people from other places who can come to japan and provide services now that's a if we want to talk about hot button issues i mean the whole discussion of migration and the fact that from my perspective as a women's rights advocate migration is incre increasingly led by women migrating that's going to be a set of conversations that i think will have to fit into this discussion around climate change because we will have climate change driven migration not just economic poverty driven migration which is what we have right any any final words for from the two of you i think we're about at the end so i think that's a, a good place to a good place to leave it with uh, kavita's intervention um it is um it is terrific that we had the three of you come and and we appreciate very much you making your time and also the the um, diverse and challenging questions from the audience. Um, I wanted, I should have flagged this up uh, ahead of time, but I neglected to want to um, suggest that there's another opportunity to come together on related issues uh, as soon as this Wednesday, also at noon, also in this room. Um, slightly, uh, well, this has been a very grounded discussion, but to suggest a very field-based focused on uh, some of these population health environment integrated programs. There's some new research that uh, John Williams has done from UC Santa Barbara uh, looking at biodiversity and biodiversity hotspots and understanding the population dynamics in there uh, uh, in those specific areas. Uh, David Lopez Carr, also from UC Santa Barbara, is going to talk about his work, particularly in Gua uh, Guatemala and Central America. And then Vic Mohan, who's a medical doctor with Blue Ventures, uh, is going to talk about uh, their work in Madagascar and in integrating um, these uh, conservation, environment, health, and population programs. So we hope you will come back and join us then. But please join me now in thanking our panelists for today's discussion.